Good morning, everyone. Hi, I'm Liz Kruger, State Senator for the 28th District, which is a new district as of January 1. So for those of you who might be new to my district, welcome. For you, those of you who are no longer in my district, no problem. All the programs we offer, all the materials we put online, all the emails we send, you are still welcome to get. It doesn't matter what district you live in. I would like to say Happy New Year to everyone, and I'd like to welcome you to um, the first event of our series for the year, our 220, 2023 Senior Roundtable Series on Living Well, Age-Friendly Housing. This morning, our first session is on affordable housing options for older adults. As always, we have closed caption on today's event if you are using Zoom or Facebook Live. And as a viewer, you have to activate the closed captioning to view the text on your device. If you're on Zoom, click on Live Transcript in the meeting controls to start viewing closed captioning. If you're on Facebook Live, you'll see a settings button on the bottom right hand corner of the video. Click on CC for closed caption to activate the process. This is a great option in both programs for anyone who sometimes doesn't think they catch every word spoken by the speakers. This forum is being recorded and everyone who RSVP'd, meaning we get your email, will receive an email with links to the event video and the resources that are posted in the chat within a few days, along with the presenters PowerPoints. So don't think you have to sit there and scribble down every phone number or note or reference that you found important because you're going to be able to get all of them again from us directly. Before we start the event, a brief COVID update. Yeah, I know we thought we'd be done with that by now. Well, at this time, only 12.9% of New York City re residents have received the COVID-19 bivalent booster, booster. That's the newest booster. It is never too late to get the up-to-date on, on your vaccinations. And in order to have maximum protection against serious illness, as well as help prevent against infection and long COVID. I know I'm hearing from a variety of people that even when you get the vaccines, you get COVID. So what's, what's the difference? Well, here's the difference. If you get the vaccine, if you get the booster, the data shows even if you might get a version of COVID, it's going to be far less serious. You're not going to end up in the hospital. You're not going to die. And you're decreasing your risks of other assorted infections and the not very pleasant long COVID. So I can't emphasize again, the right answer is, or I can't emphasize enough, the right answer is go ahead and get the vaccines and get the boosters and get the flu vaccine and wear your mask if you're in any kind of group setting. It's just becoming common sense that we have to build into our lives. Sorry. You can find vaccine sites that are administering vaccines in New York City through the New York City Vaccine Finder, Finder which is listed in the chat. Additionally, the New York City Health Commissioner issued a health advisory last month urging residents, regardless of vaccine status, to wear high quality masks when in public indoor settings and in crowded outdoor settings. And now we're gonna to move to today's event. My office, and I think every elected official's office receives large volumes of calls, mostly from older adults, about the affordability of their rents, the condition of their apartments, and their desire to live comfortably and safely in their homes or even a need to find a new home based on their age and health conditions. My 2023 roundtable series will focus on housing, covering a range of issues, including the senior citizen rent increase exemption, SCREE or rent freeze program, obtaining repairs in your rental apartment, getting your apartment assessed to ensure it is age friendly and safe for older adults. Today's round session will cover many affordable housing options. While these apartments are limited in supply and take time to access, it is definitely worth pursuing them. To help you find affordable options, we have assembled some wonderful presenters who are experts on older adult housing and committed to helping older adults access affordable and safe options. 
Our speakers today will be Allison Nickerson, Executive Director of Live On New York, who will frame the conversation and provide an overview of the affordable housing issues. Next, we will have Paul Freitag, the Executive Director of the Westside Federation for Senior Housing, who will speak about the range of affordable housing options and the different levels of support offered in each. And our last presenters are Paul Nagel, the Executive Director of Stonewall CDC, and Kat Usher, the Housing Ambassador Assistant, who will talk about the city's affordable housing resources, Housing Connect, and the Housing Ambassador Program. And now it is my pleasure to first introduce you to Allison Nickerson. Good morning, Allison. Good morning, and thank you so much, Senator Kruger, for your for the roundtable series, but also for your ongoing advocacy for this uh, critical issue. Um, so let me share my screen. Give me a second. So I am starting off the conversation today to give a context on affordable housing. Um, a bit about Live On. So Live On New York is a membership-based nonprofit. We represent 140 members that run thousands of programs um, in the city and also upstate. And our goal is really to advance systems change to make sure that all people, regardless of wealth and racial disparities, uh, racial disparities, excuse me, and other barriers, have equitable and inclusive places to age. And housing is a key component of that of our mission and of our work. Um, I normally talk about our work in three kind of areas. We do a lot of policy and advocacy work to make sure that the issues that people are facing in communities, <clears throat> excuse me, are changed at the city and state level. We do a lot of workforce um, development and workforce engagement so that uh, the programs and communities um, have the resources they need. Um, and then we also do some direct service to make sure people have uh, money in their pockets and have, are able to make ends meet. This is just a I know it's very tiny print and a lot, but the, these are all of our uh, member organizations that again run thousands of individual programs um, that help all of us age in our communities. So here's what I really wanna talk about today. So there are some real challenges when we talk about affordable senior housing. Um, in 2016, we did a study that showed that 200,000 older New Yorkers are on waiting lists for affordable housing. And that's only at one type of affordable senior housing building. Those are called HUD 202s, which I know you'll hear about in a bit. Um, and that people wait for an average of seven to nine years. We are actually in the process of redoing that study, um, but 200,000, it's not only like mind boggling, it's completely unacceptable. And people often don't have seven to nine years to wait. I mean, when you need a house and you need an affordable house, you need, you need it. You can't wait for seven to nine years. Um, at the same time, there is a complete lack of homes. So uh, the governor at the state of the state just pointed out and has said in a few different forums that our state has created 1.2 million jobs, but only 400,000 new places to live. So people from every sector, from every neighborhood are really getting squeezed and it, it often impacts older New Yorkers in a really acute way. So we know that there's just a total lack of jobs. There's uh, of jobs, excuse me, homes. Um, the third is there's a, it's a really confusing process. You're gonna hear from uh, uh, experts today, but it's still difficult. It is still hard to navigate, particularly when there's online applications and not everybody has a, access to a computer when um, there's many different programs. I mean, the, the city and state are trying to make it better, but it's still a really confusing process for folks to navigate. And the fourth is that not all housing, even if you live in affordable housing, is age friendly. We have a public housing stock that is aging itself. Um, there's lots of places where there, it's walk up only. Um, we have not the best age friendly housing. But here are some opportunities uh, that I want to leave you with. So one is there's a really uh, exciting, growing political will to tackle these issues. The governor has committed to 800,000 new homes and cutting barriers in the policy world to make sure that we build housing um, and is focusing on downstate. So focusing on the city and the surrounding areas so that we can kickstart housing development. 
Our mayor has also prioritized affordable housing, both to cut red tape and also investing in senior housing development. There are many different projects coming, coming online, coming through what they call the pipeline to be able to be built, and those are still prioritized. That's really good news. We also have growing community resources. The groups that you'll hear from are incredible. And there's a growing awareness, not only from aging services, but from the community groups that work with all ages, that senior housing is really important and a critical part of um, how we support um, our communities as we age. And the third is increased advocacy. Senator Kruger, you are just an amazing advocate um, and your whole team has been, uh, is really an incredible advocate. And so that, work really, really matters. It matters when people don't want affordable housing in neighborhoods and it requires um, our elected officials to really uh, bring courage and um, understand that affordable housing needs to be built. Um, and it also requires coordination from a lot of a lot of community groups to push those things forward. And that's that's increasing. So that's really heartening, I think. Um, one, there's two quick resources before I hand it over that I want to point out. One is, and I know the link will be added in the chat. One is um, called Image NYC. It's an interactive map of aging. And you can look at both Senator Kruger's district and all the Senate districts of New York City to see where there are certain types of housing. So it's a nice way and lots of services. Um, I selected housing on here, but you can look and see not only population trends, but where certain buildings might, might be. And so this takes information and aggregates it. So we use this a lot in our work and I just wanted to, to raise this up. This is a project of the New York Academy of Medicine. Um, and the other item I would say um, is, and I know we're talking about formal resources for affordable senior housing, but I would, I would um, be remiss if I didn't mention stipendiary programs. There are many programs that are focused on bringing resources and stipends, both for rentals and rental arrears for older New Yorkers. Many focused on, or a few focused on Manhattan. The Decay Foundation is one, the Tuttle Fund, Jarvi, um, Commonweal. So I, I will send um, Senator Kruger's team a list of those, but the they uh, have openings and they're interested in supporting older New Yorkers. So for people who qualify or who are interested, those are also some, some helpful resources. And that's it on my end. I think my time is right up. Um, this is my contact information. Feel free to reach out to me um, if you have any questions or want to get involved in the advocacy. And thank you so much for having me today. Thank you so much, Allison. And Allison will be back during the question and answer period for other questions that might be perfect for her. So really appreciate your time this morning and for opening us up, so to speak. And now we're going to hear from Paul Freitag, the executive director of the Westside Federation of Senior Housing, who's going to speak about the range of housing options and the different levels of support some of them offer. Good morning, Paul. Hi, good morning. Let me share my screen. Can can you see me? Oh. Yes. Okay, good. Okay. Let me share. Okay, and everyone can see my screen, I trust. Okay. Yep. Okay, so um, my name is Paul Freitag. I'm the executive director of the West Side Federation for Senior and Supportive Housing, which because that's a mouthful, we go by WISFISH. Um, and we actually are soon to celebrate our 50th anniversary. So although we had our origins on the West Side and we still have quite a concentration of housing and programs on the West Side of Manhattan, we've now expanded, you know, further afield throughout Manhattan and actually have now a really growing presence in the Bronx. We're one of the largest uh, providers of senior affordable housing in the Bronx. Let me go to my next slide. Okay, so I'm gonna start by just talking a bit about some definitions because a lot of terms get thrown around when we're talking about senior housing. So the first thing I just wanna talk about is, you know, when people say affordable housing, what do they mean? And the national standard for affordable housing is that the renter living in affordable housing is paying no more than 30% of their income for, for their housing. 
you know, there could be an argument whether or not that's an appropriate standard for New York City, but you know, that is a national standard and is used in most affordable housing programs to define, you know, qualifying for senior housing or for affordable housing. Additionally, you know, affordable housing is regulated, and this is partially because it is assisted. There is typically, you know, public money that goes into both the development and potentially the operations of the affordable housing. And in exchange for that, it's therefore regulated. There's oversight by city, state, sometimes federal sources to really to make sure that that affordable housing is fulfilling the mission that it was built to do. Okay, so now we're talking about, we've talked about affordable housing. The other term that gets thrown around a lot, and I think it's quite confusing, is this idea of supportive housing. And supportive housing really is not complicated. The, the idea behind supportive housing is that, you know, built into the housing, you know, so literally, you know, employed, you know, as part of the staff of the housing are typically social workers or other, you know, social services experts who provide services to the residents who live in the building. And in the case of senior housing, you know, this can range from making, helping the seniors make sure that they get entitlements, helping link them to medical care, um, you know, all sorts of different services that really the goal here is to make sure that they remain stably housed. But the key to supportive housing is, is that it is still housing. You know, it's not an institution. The people who live there, you know, pay rent. They actually are you know, much more similar to sort of standard renters than anyone else. Um, and they are not forced to use the services. The services are really provided as an overlay. And once again, really with the goal of making sure that they remain stably housed. The other thing about um, you know, supportive housing is that, you know, it, you know, people live in, you know, typical apartments, you know, they very often have studios, or they might be in a what's referred to as uh, an SRO, where they might have their own sleeping space, but then, you know, they are sharing kitchens and bathrooms, but they have their own private space as part of their living arrangement. So that is supportive housing. So finally, we move on to senior housing. So um, just to provide some context, and Allison already did this, but just maybe to hit on a couple statistics, you know, I think as we all know, you know, the percentage of New Yorkers uh, who are aging is dramatically increasing. And it is, and between 2010 and 2040, we're halfway through that, the number of New Yorkers who are over 65 is, is expected to increase by 65%. Um, and, you know, to add some more statistics to what Allison was saying, over 50% of senior renter households are rent burdened. So they are, in fact, paying more than 30% of their income on rent. And to make matters even worse, one third of them are spending over 50% of their income on rent. So there's, you know, an enormous need for affordable senior housing. Um, the next facts I have here are actually the same ones that Allison said a, a moment ago, which is just, you know, the, the fact that there is are these extensive waiting lists for senior housing, and that once you get on the waiting list, you know, you can be on it for years and years and years before your name would actually pop up and you would qualify for the housing. Um, so just to say, you know, in in New York City, we're very fortunate to have a program sponsored by the city called the SARA program, which stands, is, it stands for Senior Affordable Residential Apartments. Um, and these are this is an affordable housing program that is targeting specifically uh, seniors who are age 62 and older. It uses a variety of sort of public funding sources in order to build it. Um, and it comes, very importantly, it comes with project-based rental assistance. So what that means is that you will pay only 30% of your income at, for rent. And that if there's any additional rent that is to be charged, that will be picked up by the subsidy source. So literally by definition, this type of housing you know, will be affordable uh, for seniors. So just as a quick map, just to give a sense of sort of where Wispish's buildings and programs are. And now I just want to talk about our different types of senior housing to give you a sense of the range of senior housing that's out there. So the first category is, you know, what we refer to as independent housing. You know, so these are literally just standard, you know, typically studio or one bedroom apartments where the rent is affordable. Um, you know, we provide uh, support, supportive services in the buildings, but once again, they're completely optional. And, you know, these are really just, you know, apartments for seniors um, where the rent is set at such a level that they can afford the rent and, you know, and live stably. 
The second class of senior housing that Wisfish provides um, are, we actually run one of the only homeless shelters dedicated for an older population in New York City, um, which is our shelter called Valley Lodge. But then additionally, we own a number of SRO buildings. You know, these are his, usually typically historic buildings. Um, that was a very standard building type in New York, um, you know, you know, throughout the 20th century. And in these buildings, the seniors have their own room, and then they share kitchen and, and bath facilities. Um, these buildings typically are targeted for seniors who have a history of homelessness. And this is housing that is often, you know, uh, targeted for seniors who are living in homeless shelters and looking to move into a more independent permanent arrangement where they will have extensive services. And then finally, just to say the other thing that Wisfish does is we run a number of senior centers, which have recently been rebranded as older adult centers uh, by New York City. And just one of the key things that we do is we really try to link our housing into senior centers so that, you know, there is a rich, you know, array of services, meal programs, et cetera, that the seniors living in our buildings can access through our senior centers. Okay, so now I'm going to just quickly, very, very, very quickly talk about one of our latest buildings. And why I want to talk about this is that this actually has a range of all of the different types of housing I just described. So the first thing is that this is now where our our homeless shelter targeted for older New Yorkers is located. So we have a 110 bed um, Valley Lodge shelter, which is for seniors, home, homeless seniors. Then in addition to that, we have 119 studio apartments, which are supportive housing. This is sort of first step housing for seniors that are moving out of shelters and provides them with very, very rich services. And then we have roughly 80 units of independent housing. In this particular case, it's a mix of housing with housing for seniors seniors and also housing for families. Um, I won't go through all the building amenities, but one thing I will say that's very important is in this particular building, we have partnered with a federally qualified health center, the Institute for Family Health, and they actually provide an on-site medical clinic, which is available for the entire community that provides free or low-cost health care, but obviously also is a real resource for the residents living in this building. So just to give you an example, this is this is the building. It's quite a large building on West 108th Street between Amsterdam and Columbus. It just had its ribbon cutting in October. Um, this is a view of the lobby, you know, showing sort of the linking together all the different types of housing in uh, that are housed in this building. Um, this gives you an example. This is one of our supportive housing units. This is a studio apartment, uh, typically targeted for a senior who is, has a recent history of homelessness. And then these are just some shots of the building, you know, giving you a sense of sort of the architectural quality of the building. I wanted to show this because I do feel, you know, I think people are sometimes fearful when they hear that senior affordable senior housing or supportive housing is coming to their neighborhoods. And, you know, and I want everyone to, you know, be able to go out there and advocate, advocate and say, you know, this housing is very, very high quality housing. And in fact, it can be a real addition to our neighborhood. And that's my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Paul. And I think I really appreciate your highlighting that housing for seniors can be for all kinds of seniors with all kinds of services. And occasionally somebody will say to me, well, why do we need to provide services for homeless people, say on the east side of Manhattan or in your district? And the answer is because anybody can find themselves homeless at any time. And people call my office constantly who are elderly, who say they are about to be evicted. And if somebody doesn't come up with something, they will absolutely be on the streets. So there are all kinds of reasons people can find themselves having lost their housing with no other options. And I'm so glad that there are models being developed that recognize that we should be establishing new kinds of housing options in each community for every storyline there is for New Yorkers. So thank you very much, Paul. Next, we are moving to Housing Connects and the Ambassador Program. And I want to apologize. I previously mispronounced his name. It's Kai Usher and Paul Nagel with Stonewall CDC. And I will hand it over to them to speak in whichever order they choose. Thank you. Hi, so I'm Paul Nagel, the Executive Director of Stonewall Community Development Corporation, and I'm going to give a very quick overview of who we are and then turn it over to Kai, who runs our Housing Ambassador Program. 
So Stonewall CDC's mission is to see New York City's uh, older adult LGBTQ folks in safe, welcoming housing they can afford with access to health and mental health um, services that meet their unique needs. That being said, our services and programs are open to all New Yorkers who respect our community. Um, and the solutions that we're working on are universally applicable to the housing crisis in general. Um, we have several programs that we run as a community development corporation. Um, one is uh, emergency housing voucher navigation. Uh, we help folks with emergency housing vouchers from the COVID relief bills to get placed in permanent housing. And I'm very proud to say that we've just passed the 400 mark of 400 families being placed in permanent housing since last February. Um, we have Stonewall Village NYC, which is a, an online virtual community where LGBTQ elders can find resources, assistance, vibrant classes, activities, fellowship, and a place where they can consider and plan for what uh, how they will handle uh, aging. Um, we are building a community properties portfolio, which will be a, a network of um, homes owned by uh, the community and held in perpetual affordability. Um, and we are working on a program called Leave No Veteran Behind, where we're actually placing LGBTQ older adult veterans in home shares in the Bronx and, and now in other boroughs, actually. Um, and uh, the final is the Stonewall Bridge, which is a radically innovative intergenerational solution to support um, seniors with affirming home care um, to train millennials in LGBTQ elder care and um, pass real estate equity to the next generation. It's a very complicated and awesome vision. Uh, I hope that you will um, take the time to look at our website, stonewallcdc.org, um, and check out some of the awesome stuff we're doing. And now I'm going to turn it over to Kai to present on Housing Connect. So hello, everybody. Um, my name is Kai Usher. My pronouns are they, them. I'm the HAP Ambassador and Housing Advocate at Stonewall Community Development Corporation. Um, today, what I will be doing is going over um, the affordable housing lottery system called Housing Connect and talking about the HAP Ambassador services that are offered through um, HPD. So I'm going to share my screen right now. Give me a moment. Sorry. Okay, so this, again, we are Stonewall Community Development Corporation and my name is Kai Usher and I'll be going over Housing Connect and the HAP Ambassador Program. So what is Housing Connect? Housing Connect is an online lottery system um, where people can apply and uh, find affordable housing opportunities in New York City. Um, going back to what Paul said, um, what is affordable housing, right? Because um, that takes a huge part in what Housing Connect is. Um, affordable housing is no more than 30% of what the household is using for their, um, their, their rent and their utilities, including that. Um, for Housing Connect, though, for each lottery that you apply to, there are certain criteria that each household has to meet. Um, meaning that your income will be taken into effect, um, your household size and your community demographic, meaning like there are set asides for each lottery for some in, um, members of a community, such as like if you have a disability or if you are of a certain community board. Um, I'll go further into that later on, though, in a different slide. So Housing Connect is a partnership between private developers and HPD and HDC. So those are the two housing um, agencies or governmental programs that oversee this affordable housing lottery system. Um, so because of that, again, and I'll go over more of this later, but because of that, there are certain regulations and policies that the developers and the um, government and the tenant who is trying to apply to these lotteries have to abide by. Oh, and let me go back real quick. Um, here, though, is very important. And again, you'll get these slides um, via email or something um, later, but this is the contact information for Housing Connect. And a lot of people have a hard time understanding who to get in contact directly with via the website. So this right here is the information for that. Um, so how to apply. Um, Housing Connect is an online 
lottery system. So you have to either sign up via the website or you can go to the website, check out the available options on the website for housing um, and then submit or call um, or rather my bad, request an application um, to be mailed to you to apply to lotteries. Um, the reason why I put this picture here is because Housing Connect is had two different um, websites at some point, and this is what the page should look like. In addition to not only this is the only website for Housing Connect, um, there are other websites that basically copy and paste the information from Housing Connect and try to um, showcase that they're housing connects and they're not so i don't want anybody to get scammed when you open housing connect this is what the opening page should look like um when we're creating um a profile for housing connect what you would have to do is register using you know username and password um but the reason why i specifically screenshot this part is because in the additional contact information section um, there are two options to give. It's an email and it's a cell phone number. Um, I often suggest that people have an additional email to add to this um, section because say you are trying to retrieve your password, um, you're often, because of the functionalities of the Housing Connect website, um, you might not get the registration code sent to your um, cell phone. So, I would say use the um, the email option for the additional contact information section when registering. Um, after you register, this is the area. It's under your household um, information. Um, it's where your profile will be created. So you would have to add information such as like who your household members are, what's your income, um, what are the choices that you're looking for in terms of housing, such as neighborhoods, um, and accessibility needs. This section, um, it's gonna be again, all on Housing Connect. This is where the open lottery section is where you're going to have the available current lotteries that are being uh, marketed to um, applicants. Um, with this section, I also, because there's not ever a lot of options for the affordable housing lotteries here. I would just suggest you just go through each and every one, you know, at your time, at your pace, and just see what each building is um, offering. Um, the max I've ever seen on here was like 34 lotteries. So I feel like a few days we'll be able to get through that and understand which lotteries meet your criteria. Um, and this is an example right here of how each individual lottery page will look. Um, as you can see, there is, oh, my bad. Um, as you can see, it says the lottery ends within a certain amount of days. So applications are only available through this time and that time. Um, they'll have the address, it'll have the income eligibility, it'll have details about set asides and amenities, pictures, um, AMI levels, um, all the information about the lotteries, the individual lotteries will be in this section. So, I know that probably was like a lot, um, but this is where we come in and other housing ambassadors come in. So we meeting Stonewall CDC comes in. Um, we are a housing ambassador program. Um, we are partnered with HPD as a community-based service provider in NYC to help people apply for the affordable housing lotteries. There are other organizations such as us out there. Um, and this is what the website, and this is the URL code right here. And it's, it's a New York City governmental website. Um, so it is, um, monitored. Um, but here is where you would find other housing ambassador program services um, to assist you with. Um, again, there are certain restrictions due to COVID. Um, so I would definitely say contact the people. And then just a uh, preface, um, housing ambassadors do not provide housing directly. Um, and because a lottery is a lottery based system, so it's based upon a certain criteria or log numbers or call numbers, right, lottery numbers. Um, that is what will determine your um, application of, to a lottery. Um, so these are what we do here at Stonewall CDC and other places, other community-based organizations. Um, but at Stonewall, I'm not sure if every other organization does this, but at Stonewall, what we do is we help you through every step of the process. So 
um, breaking down what I just did about how to connect to you, um, showing you and helping you how to create and register an account, um, helping you with documentation um, submissions, understanding what documents you may need to submit. Um, if you're rejected from a lottery, we can help you understand what that rejection is and submit an appeal. Um, we can help you understand those AMI levels, which again are very significant when applying to these um, lotteries. And we can just advocate for you when speaking to marketing agents. You know, I've done research um, for clients trying to get information about what exactly, what property development exactly is overseeing this building. Um, and in addition to, because we are an LGBTQ older adult, community-based organizations, um, those who aren't tech savvy also come our way because we offer patience and understanding that this can be overwhelming. Um, and then again, LGBTQ um, plus people, we just understand, you know, the nuances when it comes to applying to things and discrimination that all these populations face. Um, and also we provide assistance with other resources outside of Housing Connect. So to make sure you're applying to everything regarding social services um, that you may need. Um, and here's our contact information over here. Um, so this is just going to be going over specifically tips and additional information regarding Housing Connects because there are certain things that um, go on that the clients should know about. Um, log numbers, which are indication of when and if you might be called, um, they are very important. They're listed on every um, lottery. Deadlines, deadlines are important. If you do not submit things by a certain time, they will not consider you. Um, keeping your up information updated as much as possible. Um, if you move, please update your profile. If you have a new job, update your profile. Um, only apply to lotteries that meet your criteria. So within the certain income eligibility ranges or if you up of that community border, sometimes they have specific senior housing on Housing Connect. So apply to that if that meets your criteria. Um, understand the other documentation was there are documents online that can help you with this and HAP ambassador, which is ourselves that can help you with this. Um, third party websites are not Housing Connect. Only Housing Connect is Housing Connect. This is what it looks like. Um, check your email and the website frequently. New lotteries are updated on the website and you can get updates via email about them. Um, the process timeline, this is not a rapid resource to housing. This takes some time, if anything, just because of documentation submissions. Um, there is an FAQ section on the website. Um, so a lot of your questions can be asked there, but then also if you want to contact Housing Connect or get in touch with any HAP ambassadors, that information is there as well. Um, and then also just be aware of other affordable housing resources that are available um, to you, such as what all um, the panelists today have spoken about and just what these things are as well. Um, so when you're applying to affordable housing, I think you should know that there are social services that you may be um, able to assess. Um, so Access HRA is a governmental assistance website that can you can take a quiz for and see what you uh, meet the criteria for in terms of social services. Um, you should be looking in the quote unquote private or regular real estate um, market for housing because there are certain agents and people who work with housing and know your rights, right? So the legality of this entire process. Um, and also, you know, there are other resources who can help you with this information, such as like YouTube. Um, and again, social service programs, right? Free financial counseling. Um, there are a lot of governmental programs out there that are partnering with community-based organizations to help clients for things. Um, and then of course, you know, reach out to those who are supposed to be servicing you as your public, and, uh, your public advocacy. So if you wanna get in touch with your local council members, um, there's this website to do so. Um, and I mentioned this because we at Stonewall, or at least when I'm talking to clients, um, I would get their email and I send them this list and an even longer list of resources to them to just have them go through um, and understand the processes, um, the processes. <laughs> um, so again, yeah, thank you for hearing us at Stonewall CDC. Um, I'm very here and happy to help with people um, who need assistance with affordable housing, just finding housing in general. Um, we 
truly care and believe in this mission um, that everyone deserves equitable housing. Um, and here's our contact information. Reach out to us about anything if you need to. Again, my name is Kai Usher, Stonewall CDC. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Kai, and thank you, Paul. I think it's really valuable to have an organization who does this daily for people to come and present on the different stories out there and the ways that you apply. And I know because my office has worked with people now for 20 years with these applications, sometimes I will have people say to me, you mean I have to make applications for all these different buildings? Like that's too much, I can't deal with that. And the answer is, but if you don't, you're never going to get the opportunity. Yes, there are lotteries. Yes, you may have to wait a long time, but if you do the paperwork for one, you pretty much have put all the paperwork into the system. And so you can then more easily make applications for multiple sites. And it does, it takes patience and takes time. And it's really helped along if you can find someone like Kai or the staff at their organization to help walk you through it. But there are other organizations as well who do this. It doesn't mean every person in New York City needs to find Kai. That might be a little overwhelming. <laughs> yes, yeah, definitely. Um, so that, but it, it, it's amazing how when someone calls us back to say, you know, I listened to you and I did the application and I thought it, it would never come through or it would be a terrible place. And then they tell you how they've been approved for some place and they've moved into it and they have a new life and they're so excited that they finally have secure housing that they know they'll be able to stay in um, and especially housing with certain kinds of services because as you age by definition you have new needs and you might have new health issues and perhaps new disabilities because those often come with aging as well and how important um, all of these services and programs are. So now I'd like to invite everybody to come back and turn on their screens to participate. Um, and just to remind you, we're gonna be sending up, sending you follow-up emails with links to the event video, all of the resources that have been listed in chat, as well as the presenters PowerPoint presentations and contact information. And we've got several questions in advance, as we usually do. We're going to go through those. Um, but you can also submit additional questions through the Q&A functions on Zoom and Facebook. I just want to point out to people, if you're asking very personal questions about themselves, we're not probably going to get to those today, um, but rather suggest that you follow up with one of the resources that we've listed today to do follow up on specific individual case issues. Although some of the individual issues are almost universal in their questions, so I will try to get as much in as I can. Um, I also want to point out that we're putting on our links um, or that we will email to you links from the Department for the Aging and Health Advocates for Older People. These links include older adult housing developments, some of which you need to apply for individually with locations and numbers. And the materials will also include a few assisted living facilities that accept Medicaid, meaning they're actually affordable to lower income seniors. There are many, many other assisted living facilities in the city of New York that you can find information about, but we're not going to cite them all individually. And just a heads up, some of the non-Medicaid assisted living facilities are pretty amazing looking, but we're also talking about 10 to $15,000 a month um, to live there. So you have to factor all of that in to your own planning and your own reality. Okay, so now to start with Q&A. And again, I'm just gonna ask the question and any or every member of the panel is welcome to answer. Um, and if nobody does, we'll admit it's a stump the panelists question. Um, wait lists. 
so I'm wondering about the issue of wait lists for affordable senior housing. How do you find out about them and how do you get on them and stay on them? Anybody know an answer? You just have to take yourself off mute. So I, I can jump in on that. So, you know, this is a, this question, you know, goes right to the heart of when was that senior housing first built? So for more recent housing, those, the wait lists there tend to be uh, controlled through the Housing Connect system that, you know, Paul and Kai talked a great deal about. For older senior housing that you know, pre-existed the Housing Connect system, in those buildings, there tends to be a specific wait list you know, for each building. And so you can't find out about you know, the availability of housing through Housing Connect. You have to go to that specific building. Uh, frankly, for a number of our buildings, you know, our wait list can exceed the length of time that Allison, you know, presented as an average time on a wait list. Um, you know, our wait list can become over a decade long. And we actually, we like many uh, senior housing providers, when our wait lists get to be too long, we close them. We don't just keep adding names to the bottom of the list, you know, with people having to wait 15, 20 years for housing. We, we stop taking names. We go through the list. And then as the list begins to, you know, get towards the end, we will, you know, essentially at that point, contact everyone on the list, say, are you still interested? If so, they would stay on the list. And then we would open it up again and, you know, and take new applications. But it, you know, it is in some respects a more daunting process because it's not centralized. Thank you. Are there any new initiative plans initiatives plan to quickly make up for the lag in providing more access to senior housing. And this person is specifically asking in central Manhattan. And I will tell you, no, there's no quick way to build new housing. And truthfully, the cost of real estate in, say, my district in Manhattan is so much more expensive than almost anywhere else in the state of New York that this area is less likely to see additional um, new units of senior housing or any other form of affordable housing. Although I constantly try to pitch and convince city and state government that we should prioritize the distribution of affordable housing into any new buildings going up and certainly not provide any kind of tax incentives to build luxury buildings that aren't also including a significant percentage of affordable housing. Um, a new program was just announced in hypothetical by the mayor and referenced by the governor in her state of the state about converting older commercial buildings into residential housing. I actually think it's a perfectly reasonable idea and quite a bit of the quote unquote older commercial buildings that are quote unquote less use, usable moving into the future as commercial are in fact in Manhattan, um, east through west, south of 59th Street. So I am working already with a variety of other electeds and advocates for this idea. Um, to see whether we can get any of these proposals off the ground. And yes, it does take less time to convert an existing building than to start from scratch. Um, but again, this proposal was just rolled out, I believe, by Mayor Adams in an announcement and a report maybe three days ago. So when you say quick, I'm going to tell you that if you're a senior citizen, your best options are to explore what's already in existence, to find out through these various sites we're referring you to, what is available, how do you apply for it, how do you learn whether you are eligible for it. Because quick and building housing in New York City are not necessarily two terms that go together so easily. Um, and we are facing, as Governor Hochul said, an 800,000 unit shortage. So nothing is going to be quick that deals with the sheer volume of units that we need to build. Okay, options for subsidies to age in place. Are there any affordable options to help a person maintain and live in their current New York City apartment? 
Senator, can I uh, respond to that? And also in, in thinking through the last question and you're totally yes. right about the lack of quickness. Um, one of the strategies that we have used and Paul Freitag knows this well because has joined in a lot of this advocacy is really to preserve the affordable units that currently exist because we're we're not going to be able to build ourselves out of the housing crisis that older people are experiencing. There's just not enough land to meet the demand right now. So another option is either making your apartment safer, right? There are some councilmatic initiatives in the city. There are certain state funding streams. There are certain um, initiatives to add grab bars to do certain, you know, to modify apartments. And I know you're, there's, that will be talked about uh, in a later session. Um, and also preserve it through SPREE, through stipend programs. Usually for stipendiary programs, people need a case manager. So if you know of someone who's on a case minute, has a city or state funded case manager, um, that's one way to explore those funds. Um, but that is the best way to, a, a, to a, the quickest way to approach the need for affordable senior housing is to explore all of them. Building is important, but we can't possibly develop enough housing right this second. Thank you. And also just throw in that it is always worthwhile to double check whether you are being charged the correct amount of rent. And because sometimes people find that they have been being overcharged and they might need to bring a case, say they live in a building that has a J51 or 421A tax abatement. All of those units are supposed to be rent regulated and registered. And sometimes we have found, and we have worked with um, lawyers who take these cases without charging people and they'll find an entire building where people have been overcharged rent literally for decades and courts will order the rent to be reset back at what it should have been and money paid back to people so it's not really part of the discussion today but i certainly always want to urge people if they feel that their rent has been skyrocketing um, or that there's just something wrong or they just have never thought to ask before that they ought to be cross-checking whether it's possible that they are actually being overcharged for rent because then there are things that can be done. You referenced SCREE and we're going to have a, um, a whole program on that next. And there, there are also emergency rent grants that can help with an emergency, but they are technically legally obligated to be paid back and you don't get them unless you can show that getting the emergency grant will actually stabilize and make it possible for you to stay in the home you have now so never say never but there's always strings attached to any storyline and you just need to be aware of those also okay tenants rights do i have an additional right as a 65 year old renting the same for apartment for 25 years. Do you have any special rights if you've been there that long and are over 65? I mean, I know SCREE again, which we're not talking about, which is specifically for people over a certain age or with disabilities, but I think it's more a story than a truth that somehow you get extra benefits when you hit 65 in most private rental housing. No one's disagreeing with me, so we'll leave that there for now. Um, how do you deal with an impossible landlord? Oh, doesn't matter how old you are or what kind of housing you're living in. What's everybody's recommendation to how to deal with an impossible landlord? Okay, uh, then I'll jump in again. Oh, yes, Paul. I, I, I would recommend, um, there's a group called Just Fix. Um, which began uh, as an online um, guide to help you get landlords to fix issues that they weren't addressing. And a lot of times the landlord will stop addressing issues as a way of um, doing an informal eviction, meaning getting you out of the building without having to take you to court. Um, Just Fix has really advanced since then. Um, they can now uh, identify from their metadata 
um, bad actors in, across the city. So uh, you can find out if your landlord tends to be a bad actor. Um, they also can um, identify all of the properties in a, a landlord's portfolio. Um, and if any of them have been illegally claimed as no longer rent uh, controlled, their entire portfolio has to be reviewed. Um, so it just fix is a really great resource and it's free. Great, thank you for that. And I think that ties into a group of questions that I'm going to just um, take together and point out, just starting out that our March roundtable in this series will focus on getting repairs in your apartment, what your legal rights are, and strategies to compel your landlord to make the repairs. So we're going to double check with what's fixed, uh, let's just fix before that, um, and highlight that many times when people describe having an impossible landlord, it is because they refuse to make the repairs um, and do what they're supposed to do under the tenant's rights under their um, lease. And it is a continuing challenge um, to figure out your rights, what you can do when you can go to court with an HP action, what are some of the other strategies that do work, and all kinds of questions like just the one today that I'm also going to leave until a later date. You know, if you've been in your apartment for X number of years, does the landlord have to make replacements and provide updates without charging any extra rent? And those are trick questions also depending on what kind of housing you live in and the level of condition problem. But since we're having a whole round table on this, please come back to our March round table unless you need the question and ask, answer it earlier. And then on the list of references and resources, there are gonna be a number of groups that you can check with earlier than March. Identifying affordable options. I see the ads for affordable housing and the income ranges is more than what I have yet the rents are hundreds of dollars a month less than I am paying, and I have scree. Why can't the minimum income be lowered in such cases? With the new Social Security, I'm still paying over 60% of my income um, towards rent. So can somebody help jive the rules of the road for the, I guess, lottery apartments with the reality of someone who's already on scree so thinks they should be already paying a reasonable rent. Um, so screen injury programs are different from the lottery. Um, screen injury programs are rent stabilized apartments already. Um, so that's how you would meet the criteria for SCREE in addition to other criteria um, that is listed within SCREE. Um, but all programs, all housing, um, available options are income based. Um, so, unless you have a voucher or, my bad, a rental subsidy, um, then your chances of getting into the lottery programs via such things as Housing Connect would then like increase. Um, but again, it's still very individualistic um, in terms of you getting into the lotteries. Every situation is just, it's different. Thank you. This is a great question. I don't think I've ever heard an answer. Is there a list located of landlords who offer affordable housing without any government funding or programs associated? Where do I get a copy? I'd like a copy too if it existed. Does anybody know of such a list? Yeah, I no. think yeah. <laughs> there's only like some list that like of brokers that people I feel like over time collects that like work with certain incomes or work with certain rental subsidies um, or are known to but no <laughs> yeah great question I don't think that the, the fundamental issue that is housing is so expensive in the city um, that I'm just not sure that there is a universe of private housing that there's availability, it goes on a list. I do know and it's not what we see a lot in my district, but there are various communities in other parts of the city where they sometimes have more one through three family houses 
and a private landlord who's just the owner of that three unit house, you know, decides that they really like certain people and want them to have, you know, a permanent living arrangement and don't want to see turnover in their tenants. And so they will make private deals that seem extraordinarily reasonable compared to some of the apartment costs we see, you know, in most of Brooklyn and pretty much all of Manhattan. But I don't think anybody's posting or listing somewhere, you know, this is my home. I like to have really nice tenants who never leave and are quiet. And mm -hmm. if you fall into that category, let me know. I, you know, maybe we should try to get somebody to start a website like that. But I, I don't think I'm aware of that. Sorry. Um, another question is about, is there any way to learn about what the transportation options are near to senior housing? I guess so that the person can figure out whether that seems like a reasonable place to move or not. Do any of the sort of affordable housing sites list available transportation nearby as part of what they share online or share about the building? I don't know. I'm sorry, Paul, were you there? Go no, ahead. I mean, the, the person who's going to know that is Kai, because Kai deals with the Housing Connect site every day. Um, my recommendation is to call the provider of the, the housing. Um, you know, there's, they're all over the map, right, in terms of if it's a HPD building, if it's a Mitchell Lama building. I think calling that, you know, there's there's tech options, right? There's the map, there's Google, there's all sorts of things, but probably calling because there's informal things too, right? There's senior transportation, there's there's all sorts of types of transportation and the building itself would probably be able to answer that. Kai, I don't know if you have other thoughts on that. Yeah, no, I definitely agree. Um, I know in Housing Connect, there's like a, a map icon. So like it does lead you to Google once you click on it and they do list um, some of the transportation um, options on that. But yeah, like you said, calling the property developers would be a good way. I'm calling the building um, and just Googling it because then if you look on the map icon, it'll tell you like what's around the area. It will show you more details. Great. Thank you. You can also call the organ, if there's any senior service organizations in the area, they would be another good resource because there's a lot that's not listed online. And so there are a lot of informal and formal things that would just be kind of tricky to find. So I would say if there's an older adult center or if there's a case management program nearby, that, that would be another resource. I, I will say in a number of our buildings, one of the things the social workers do is help residents arrange transportation to doctor's appointments, you know, and, and things like that. So, you know, there are a lot of different options. Sometimes you have to wait a bit, but you know, that are available in order to, you know, help seniors, you know, get to where they need to go. Great, thank you. Um, just a couple more that were early requested questions and then I'll jump to the chat questions, which seem to be growing. Um, what's, def what's the definition of senior for senior housing in New York City? Because every program seems to have a different age cutoff. Is there a standard age 60, 65 for senior housing eligibility? You know, this, there are different standards and it, for in our housing, for instance, you know, if in fact, you know, the definition say for independent senior housing you know, what we think of as the old 202 model, you know, it's 62 and a half um, for, you know, our housing, which is particularly targeted to try to help, you know, seniors move out of um, homeless shelters, you know, seniors who are currently in shelters, you know, that number can drop to 60, even, you know, 55, depending on the situation. So, um, you know, it is, I think, flexible, depending on the type of housing that's being provided. So the answer, I think, is you have to just look for the age cutoff when you're reviewing the paperwork on any potential building or program, because it could be different in different places. Ah. Huh. Where can you get, if you're low income and a senior and you live in rent regulated housing, where can you get legal, legal assistance for representation on your case? And I will just tell you that, I mean, the answer is pretty much legal services, legal aid organizations. The city of New York claims that it's got a 
free um, program for housing representation and housing court, but they're also short of lawyers and there's wait lists. And it's a real challenge for us right now because so many people are in housing trouble and lined up in housing court with cases that they literally can't find enough lawyers in many neighborhoods um, to represent in housing court. But I would still refer you to your nearest legal aid or legal service office. And we can make that list available when we send out materials as well um, to ask them whether they can take your case. And I think they are prioritizing based on the seriousness of it and the closeness to an actual eviction. But you can also ask them if they can't take your case, do they know anyone else who could possibly take your case? Um, because there are not-for-profit organizations and some settlement houses that run legal service units as well that aren't legally defined as a legal service organization or a legal aid society group. Is there Senator, anyone else I should be telling people about? Senator Kruger, um, there are four organizations that contract with the city of New York to provide elder service, uh, elder legal service assistance in Manhattan. It is um, Legal Services NYC and also uh, Mobilization for Justice, I believe. Um, and there are there's another in the Bronx and there's another in uh, Brooklyn. I'm, pretty sure, but I can send over that information. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, it's in Queens, it's JASA, and um, I'm gonna get it wrong. Uh, I forget who's in the Bronx. Um, but those are some places to go that are specific to elder law that might be able to work a bit differently than um, some of the eviction prevention groups. Maybe right. not, but it's a resource. But that's great, so thank you. Thank you, that's very helpful. Um, somebody asking specifically about Medicaid accepting um, assisted living facilities. Does anybody know if there's a master list somewhere? Okay. I don't know if there's a master list, but if the person is on a managed long-term care plan, is that that's how they are receiving their Medicaid, I would, ask a case manager through the MLTC because they may have recommendations there, but I don't know of a master list. No, we, when we have uh, seniors who, for whatever reason, can no longer live independently in, in our buildings, even with a lot of services, we, you know, we will directly contact, you know, places when we happen to know a number of places that accept Medicaid, but we will, you know, contact places and ask them and talk to them about their willingness to accept Medicaid. Thank you. Okay, so now I'm shifting to the questions that have shown up on chat or Q&A, excuse me. Um, are there any senior housing residences specifically for people who are seniors and blind? So typically when we when we do buildings, new buildings, there will be a certain percentage, usually a fairly small percentage of units that are set aside for people who are hearing and visually impaired. Um, to be honest, you know, we those those and so people, if you apply going through the lottery system and you, you know demonstrate that you are hearing and visually impaired, you know, there's a verification process that goes for you essentially jump to the top of the list in order for those particular units. Um, often those units, you know, it's not like we have a ton of people going for those units. So I think I would encourage people, you know, who are hearing and visually impaired, you know, and are interested in affordable housing to make sure that they, you know, make that apparent as part of the lottery process. Thank you. I do know that there is one building, I think it's still in my district. I think it's called the Sellis House on West 23rd. Sellis Matter. Yeah. Tennis Sellis Manor that I think is a section 202 building and is specifically for vision impaired people. I so I don't know how the application process works, but that's the one specific facility I'm aware of. Yeah, they're run by Vision Services for the Blind and Visually Impaired. Um, and they're also an incredible organization, so could also help with that process um, looking for units, I'm sure. Great. 
Thank you. The New York State Commission for the Blind is also pretty proactive um, if you contact them. And they have connections with all of the providers um, who have uh, those kinds of facilities. And then there is a, a set aside in every Housing Connect listing for um, visual um, and mobility impairment. Um, it's a small set aside, but again, there's a section in your application on Housing Connect where you have to make it clear um, that you have that disability. Okay. Uh, so here's someone, I guess, frustrated that their unit is supposed to be rent protected, rent regulated, I'm assuming is what they mean, but it's market rate. How did that happen? I'll take a jump at that. Like It happens because you actually can be in a building where they might have gotten, say, 421A, where all of the units must, by law, be rent regulated, but the but the majority of the units are market rate. So it's one of the reasons that I never liked the 421A program, where we spent a lot of taxpayer money incentivizing the building of these big buildings, but a tiny percentage are actually affordable to anyone who really needs them, even though everybody's getting the incentive. So again, as I said before, you always want to cross check through the state housing agency, the history of the rent that you're paying and whether in fact it's in, they're in violation. It may be that that they're not following the rent regulation laws correctly for your unit. And you should always want to double check that. But it is also quite possible that you legally have a rent regulated unit that is a market rate that it's hard to believe anybody defined this as an affordable unit. I know I have studio apartments that have gone up in 421As in my district that started 5,000 a month. I don't think that's what we were all talking about when we were talking about affordable housing. But that's why you always have to individually cross check and see what the story is. Um, all right, for many of, oh, many seniors don't have internet or really feel like they know how to use it. Can they apply for all of this lottery housing without actually using the internet? Um, yes. And no, um, I would say it would take um, a client to maybe get in contact with like a local community organization um, to then get a number of an organization who can help you with the process. Um, so like, say if someone calls me and is like, hey, I want to apply to some lottery, you can like set up an appointment and I could go through all the lotteries with them on the website um, and then reach out to those property management teams um, and receive the paper application for the client and they can fill it out and then mail it back. So it's a mix of both still, or just organization getting in contact with somebody. We do accept paper applications, but I, I would really recommend people who are interested essentially getting assistance so they can apply online. I just feel like that way they're, they're really, you know, part of the, how the process is going to go forward, you know, should their number come up. I have to agree with you both. I think that you can do it by paper, but given the history of does the mail get there? Do you know that it actually ever got to the right person? Did they do the entering into the computer? And probably not. Um, can you update? Can you track? No, you can't do any of those things. So I'd be very hesitant to use the old fashioned mail system because I think you'll be very sorry when somebody later on tells you, we have no idea, you're not in our system at all. Um, and at least if you do it online, even with the help of others, you can confirm that your information is there, that everything's been filed, and you can update and change. And you can also copy to the next lottery application. Um, so yeah, I would really strongly urge people not to try the paper route for themselves. Um, people ask, is there a timeline for hearing back of whether you're accepted or not. There's no standard timeline. Some of these lotteries have specific dates by which you have to get the applications in and then they quote unquote, you know, pick from the lottery and you hear. So in some of the buildings you, you will hear by a certain date. 
Um, am I correct? Is that still the way it works? Um, partially. Um, it's a lottery, so just in general, you're not um, guaranteed to hear back from. Um, but there is just a general, like you said, time frame for which applications are allowed to be submitted, and then there's a time frame for which marketing agents go through those applications. Um, and so, it's both. Yeah, they they generally will not contact you to tell you you didn't get it, but the Housing Connect has the history of every application you've made and what the status of it is at the current time. So you can always go into Housing Connect and check and see if there's a chance that you're still eligible. Exactly. Got it. Thank you. Um, if you live in a specific area or borough, do you get any preference for lottery apartments in that area or borough? I'll, I'll take the, I'll take this yeah. one. This is, this is a fascinating question for us. So, um, um, this that we get more questions and comments about this than almost any other topic. And so I really like to explain why it's organized the way it is. And it has to do with something I'm sure we all believe in, which is fair housing. So fair housing is a federal program and is designed in order to make sure that, you know, there is not discrimination in housing. So although it makes perfect sense that you're building housing in a particular neighborhood and there should be a preference for the people living in that neighborhood they've been there forever they have to endure the construction you know all sorts of good reasons that i would support in the interest of fair housing you can't create these preferences that could be exclusionary of people on the basis of fair housing categories now, fine, we, I think we could all agree with that. The problem is that sort of this is, gets litigated and sort of back and forth in terms of sort of, you know, what is, say, a preference that is okay and would not violate fair housing? So, you know, I've been doing affordable housing for many, many, many years. You know, there was a time when it was very typical to provide a preference for the local community board. I think that's now perceived as being too small an area and is exclusionary. Right now, it seems to be that, you know, preferences that are borough wide, the buildings in Manhattan, and therefore a certain percentage of units would be reserved for people living in Manhattan, seems to be okay by fair housing. But, you know, next year that could change. You know, I have to say this has been a real moving target in terms of sort of what is agreed by, you know, all sorts of attorneys and people who care a lot about fair housing as well, they should, you know, to not somehow be, you know, exclusionary. Thank you. Okay, there's some more questions about paper applications. And again, I think we sort of covered why you're a lot better off going the internet route. Um, people question about section eight housing person describing having spent a long time applying over and over again for section eight units, never got anything. Um, so is it possible never to get picked? I think the answer is yes, because the, the waiting lists for certain kinds of housing, including NYCHA housing, um, can be longer than you might have to live. But do, do we have any updates on timeframes and uh, waiting lists for Section 8 housing for seniors at this time? Um, I can just say that WISFISH, our policy is that, you know, we make sure that our buildings actually have project-based Section 8, which means that you get Section 8 by just moving into that apartment um, before we'll proceed with the project, because we feel it's so um, important for, um, you know, the, for the seniors to actually be able to afford the units that they're living in. So part of our whole development process is going through the process of, you know, qualifying the units that they are considered Section 8 units. Um, but, you know, because they are then therefore, you know, very, very affordable for seniors, you know, I think that there tends to be an awful lot of sort of interest in those units and the number of people who apply for them can be very high. Got it. And so again, while some people think some of us have made it sound like if you make the applications, you're guaranteed you're going to get housing. That's not true. And I don't believe any of us said that because we've all done this kind of work. And we know that the word lottery is the word lottery for a number of reasons. They, they actually pull your application out as the winner. But it's just like when you play the lottery for gambling your chances of winning are not 100%. Um, in fact, statistically, you're better off with a housing lottery than with a lottery ticket in New York, but you still 
are just in line trying to get a unit that there are far more people trying than the number of available units and that is just a fact of life for um, the housing realities of New York City. Um, and yes, it's particularly true if you're committed to trying to stay in Manhattan, as I think many of the people asking questions are. You live in Manhattan, you love Manhattan, I live in Manhattan, I love Manhattan. Unfortunately, the availability of affordable units, I think, is less here than in any of the other boroughs. And it isn't any and it isn't easy anywhere in the city of New York. So I think you do have to keep open minded that the buildings you might be applying for may very well not be anywhere near the neighborhood you're currently living in. Um, then there are people asking about why are the income levels established by the federal government and they seem just too high for low income seniors to even afford the rentals in, even though these are quote unquote affordable units. And there's a bunch of different rules around why the federal government sets the levels and they're based off of what's called AMI and they use a regional AMI, which most of us have realized is really not rational for New York City um, because they're throwing us in with housing costs in Westchester and Nassau County and what does that actually have to do with the costs in the five boroughs? So yes, I agree there are problems. And I think in government, we're always struggling to try to fix that and to try to adjust. But on some of the programs, these are just mandated um, by law. And we can agree with you, but we can't necessarily get them changed. Um, what are some of the other oh i'm sorry one of the questions was when they're counting your income for eligibility are they also counting assets and how does that work yes they're calculating on um, your assets um, it just depends on what types of assets um, and there is a marketing handbook that um, link that does break it down more easily um, to understand, but then also um, what I also suggest clients do is speak to a free financial advisor um, that HPD is in contact with um, regarding their specific situations, because I've had very like nuanced situations with clients where I just personally, or maybe some other have ambassadors who just understand Housing Connect as its function, um, will be able to assist with. Thank you. I guess somebody asking me about this proposal to shift commercial buildings to residential buildings and their understanding of the city is heavily reliant on commercial real estate tax. So the buildings that would be converted are the buildings that are actually not successfully renting themselves out anymore as commercial buildings. So in fact, if they're not successful commercial buildings, we're not getting taxes from them anyway. Um, but my actual understanding is the property taxes from residential buildings are actually per unit higher than commercial. So no, I don't think the city's concerned that conversion from commercial to residential will have a negative impact on their tax revenues. Um, but again, that program is just right now a hypothetical with all the details to be filled in. Um, so it's an excellent question for all of us to be looking at. Thank you. Um, oh, good. We are doing an event with Just Fix in March. So thank you, Staffer, for sharing that with me. We already found out about Just Fix. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's see. A respectful observation. I've been on the Client Connect register for many years. It seems recently that the minimum in income requirement for new housing has gone up so much it appears to be unaffordable. It's a bit discouraging. Um, mm -hmm. I'm assuming that's nothing we did to change that. What changed? Well, it's based on the a AMI for the whole area. Um, and that means area median income, and those are based on uh, federal uh, levels that are set each year. 
The problem with the New York City metro area is that it's all one AMI. So we have people in the Bronx subject to the same AMI as people in Manhattan. Um, and that can make incredible disparities in terms of, of what's affordable. Um, my particular issue with affordable housing was I was in a, an income bracket where I never got a single response on the lotteries. And now my income went up and I get responses all the time, but I can't afford the rents they're offering. <laughs> Right, which I think is exactly the point of several people in the chat and their concerns. And I agree that, you know, somebody asked before what makes you a senior, I think the real question is what makes something affordable. And we have flunked the test of being honest about what units are affordable to New Yorkers who need units and that we need to bring down if we're going to stick with AMI then it has to be a lower percentage of AMI. You know, so sometimes in um, 421A, there were different categories going up to 125% of AMI or 130% and the advocates kept saying, we need 50% of AMI housing. That's what we're talking about. So I really think we need a clarification and an honest formula for what is affordable housing for different size households. And I'm hoping that as the city and state go forward in the coming year to create new programs to meet, to attempt to meet these enormous targets. The city says it wants to build 500,000 units in 10 years, the state says 800,000. Not separate from the city, but of the 800,000, 500,000 would be in the city. But if they aren't actually targeting the rents in those units to what people need and can afford, we're going to have flunked the test. So I think that that's a, as a legislator, only speaking for myself, I think that's a critical part of the assignment we are moving into of designing new programs that will create actual affordable units to come online. And thank you to, oh, please, Paul. Yes. I just want to say one bright spot about that. There's a, you know, a very powerful program that's used to create a lot of affordable housing called the Low Income Housing Tax Credit. And it, you know, forever has set its limit at 60% of AMI. They've very recently, you know, modified the legislation to allow you to do something called income averaging. So to give a very simple example, if half of your units were at 70% and half of your units were at 50%, that would average 60% and you therefore you know, can arrive at a broader band. And I think people are beginning to use that in order to create more of an income mix within buildings that could target people both lower income and then balance that off by also having a few units for people at higher income. So it's sort of a, a fairly new modification that's been made. It'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Great. So we've actually gone over time. So I'm going to have to stop taking questions, although I want to highlight our friends that live on actually put on chat and we'll be sending it out to people, um, lists and maps of where, um, excuse me, Medicaid eligible assisted living facilities are in the city. So that information will be able to be gotten by anyone who's watching us. I want to thank profusely my guests today, um, not only for coming on and speaking to us, but for the organizations they represent and the amazing work they're doing every day of the year uh, to Allison, to Kai, to Paul, and to Paul. I want to remind everybody that our next roundtable is scheduled for Thursday, February 9th, also at 10 a.m., and we'll cover the senior citizen rent exemption, SCREE, or Rent Freeze program. There were a bunch of questions on that today. And again, all of you out there listening and watching, thank you so much for joining us, and as always, Thank you to my staff with whom none of this would ever happen. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you.